So this presentation should be a little bit quicker. Uh, it's simply an overview of, of ideas and, and considerations that you should have as far as <coughs> avoiding biases in model calibration, biases that come from uh, things related to your current state. Uh, I want to start out with talking about spatial autocorrelations of environments. And this is I'd be really amazed if anybody can tell me where this is in the world. You would want to cry if you could get this one. I'll give you a clue. It's cut off here. It's a really hard one. That's the northern tip of Australia. Okay? Now, what I've got here, you see these black squares? That is a climate thing. It's like those, those biochromatic layers that you were looking at yesterday for Africa. And the interesting thing is that dimension has essentially the same value across this whole area. Now this image, which I put on top of it, that is a satellite image. I've been talking with a couple of you about MODIS data. The spatial resolution of that image is 250 meters. And what you can see is that it goes from these very light values to these very dark values. And it does that over very really small areas. Okay, which is to say there's a lot of variation in the spectral reflectance that the modus image is covering, and almost no variation in the climate curve. So when we talk about autocorrelation, imagine taking one surface, spatial autocorrelation, taking one surface and measuring similarity over different distances. For this climate parameter, it's over very, very long distances that you still have a lot of similarity. And for the, this, the spectral reflectance coverage, it's over very short distances. So imagine we plotted a bunch of points and we took all the points that are close together and we measure their values. And then we take pairs of points that are far apart and we measure their values. And these are essentially pairs of values. It's the value here and the value here, right? In a spatially autocorrelated world, these short distances would be very, these pairs of points separated by short distances would be very similar to one another. Okay? And these pairs, oops, sorry, these pairs of points separated by long distances would be very different. Okay? And you see the, the breakdown of spatial autocorrelation. So if you use arc, you get an output like this. Here's the distance, and this is the accumulation of variance. And so what you see is that as you get farther and farther apart, we accumulate more and more variance. That's essentially because these points that are at shorter distances are not, in, not independent of one another. It's only when we get out to about here where we see that no additional variance accumulates. And so beyond some point right about there, what we're seeing is that Okay, these points, points separated by more than that distance, whatever it is, are effectively independent of one another given the autocorrelation of that set of environments. And you've just seen that a climate, a set of climate parameters, they have very broad autocorrelation, which is to say this curve would still be going up and then would flatten out out here. Whereas that, that spectral reflectance um, coverage from MODIS would probably go up sharply and level off. Okay? So, here I've contrasted temperature and precipitation. And what you can see is that precipitation levels off right here around 200 kilometers. This is for one particular landscape. Whereas temperature le levels off at 600 kilometers. And so the point is that if I have two points that are separated by 25 kilometers, they are not independent in terms of either of these variables. 
they tend to measure the same thing. They will not randomly tend to have very similar values and not for any reason other than that they're close together. Okay? So that's spatial autocorrelation. I want to give you an example of how you may have to uh, should incorporate that into your studies. This is a study of uh, uh, Ascaris, uh, intestinal parasite, I tell me. Uh, Ascaris prevalence is across East Africa, being done by one of my, my doctoral students. You see these texts, it's a little hard to see. Those are zero prevalence villages. And then you see medium sized circles, those are medium prevalences. Then you see really big circles, those are really high prevalences. So, we measured the spatial autocorrelation of the environmental layers that we were using for this study, and it basically came out at 50 or 60 kilometers. Here we have a beautiful sample size of more than 3,000 sample points. Here's what we ended up doing. We said, okay, we can't consider any pair of points that is closer to each other than that 50 or 60 kilometers. And so any pair of points, we threw out one so that we had no pair of points that was closer to each other than 60 kilometers. And so we imposed this grid, and basically all we did was use 52 grid cells. So we went from a sample size of more than 3,000 to a sample size of 52. That's the cruel world of spatial autocorrelation. And just to pre-shadow what Richard will be talking about tomorrow, training areas and testing areas don't have to be separated spatially if we rarify them to take into account spatial autocorrelation. If those points are similar, they're similar because the species chose that set of conditions, but they're not similar because they're close together. So in the end, we produced this map. The darker shaded areas are higher risk, and the, lo the lighter shaded areas are, are lower risk. Uh, and this, I don't have the testing points, but this map actually fared quite well when we tested with with uh, points for Ascaris prevalences across Ethiopia and Eritrea. So essentially the point is this. Imagine I give you some environment that varies like that, and I give you two points. Maybe this one has a value of 20 and this one has a value of 10. Are they significantly different? There's only one correct answer. That is, I don't know. Okay? You don't know because it's a sample size of one for each class. Now, I'm going to do this. Nice big sample size. And I'm going to ask, are they significantly different? Anybody willing to take a guess, thinking about spatial autocorrelation? Big sample size, if you put it in a t-test, they are significantly different. But <coughs> notice that they're sampled from an area where the environment is essentially invariant. So are these six points independent of one another? Probably not. And are these six points independent of one another? Probably not. So in reality, you have one point for this class and one point for that class. And the answer has to be, I don't know. Okay? So that's, that's the, the cruel reality of spatial autocorrelation. Uh, this is just a fun example that I want to show you of the next level of complications. Okay, one thing is spatial autocorrelation. A very different thing is all of the spatial noise and confusion that will enter into your data set. This is a very old paper, and actually rather you didn't read it because it's, it's so old that essentially all the methods have changed. But I wanted to show you one, one set of data, which is kind of amusing. The two species of basses, the large predatory fishes in, in North America, and 
and the concern was whether they were potential invaders into Japanese freshwater environments. And so one of the species is largemouth bass. Those are points for it. You can see some strange things in here. Look at that. Lots of points in Massachusetts and New England. Lots of points in the southeast within these big open areas. I grew up right there. And I can guarantee you there were large amount of bass. And I ate those about once a month during all of my adolescence. Uh, but this was a reasonably good uh, set of data for modeling. Developed a model. Projected it to Japanese environments. There's our prediction for Japan. And there are the testing points, which are invasive populations of that species in Japan. So in the big scheme of things, the large amount of bass model worked pretty well. Here's the points for smallmouth bass, the other species. And this is one of the most extreme cases of bias that I've ever seen. Points here and there across the eastern US, a few points out west. Anybody know what that is? Have to know your US geography. It's the state of Illinois. One researcher spent his whole career sampling every stream reach across Illinois. And so each one of those data points is some little piece of stream. And so those points aren't wrong. There were smallmouth basses there. These points aren't wrong. But this over-concentration means that if you base a niche model on something like that, what you're going to get is more a model of the environments of Illinois than a model of the environments uh, that, that this species prefers. Okay? This goes back to Richard's comment about garbage in and garbage out. If you put that in, you get something out. You get a nice map. Does the map have any predicted power? Probably not. Because that's not a good sampling, a nice, even sampling of the environments used by the species. That's a nice, even sampling of, of the details of the topography of the state of Illinois. So we can quantify this. This is a nice, simple paper, but uh, very useful. It goes back a little bit of time to 2004. And it's simply asking whether sampling along the roadsides across Israel has environmental biases. This is just one of the dimensions they looked at. But if you look at the areas near roads, that's shown in black, and the areas across the country are shown in gray with respect to annual rainfall. And what you can see is that if you do roadside sampling, you're oversampling wet areas of the country, and you're undersampling dry areas of the country. Okay? So these are, remember what Richard told you yesterday, these are biases, not just in space, like in roadside bias question, but in environment. And that'll be a garbage in, garbage out situation. If you sample on roads, it's going to be hard to see distributional phenomena under dry conditions because those phenomena will be undersampled if you follow the roads of this road. And you can do that on any uh, study area that you're interested in. It just takes a little bit of work. So, just to give you a really quick scan through uh, types of spatial bias, here in the birth of the world, that's about 85 million records. And right away you can see Russia, the Arabian Peninsula, Northern Africa, parts of interior South America are not very well represented. There's plants, pretty much the same thing, green ones. Mammals, it gets worse. Insects, that's not one species of insect, that's all insects. And you can see now essentially nothing in, in China. There's mosquitoes, okay, getting pretty bad for the 
public health people here. We go from mosquitoes to sandbags. Getting really bad. Right? And then some of us work with pathogens and viruses. And so when we were working with birds, we were seeing a reasonable couple of coverage of the whole world. When we're working with viruses, that's all bias. That's all just where somebody was sampling. The Great Lakes, uh, Western Australia. There's going to be no niche signal in that, in those data. Okay? So, we can now go ahead and take a next step, which is to incorporate sampling bias directly into our models. Okay? I was casting around for a good example of this last night. I think I was pretty sleepy. Needless to say, I didn't find a good example. And this morning, I was reading back issues of science, trying to wake up. And lo and behold, I find this. Really interesting paper on malaria in Kenya. And published in science this past year. Now, in malaria, you could just count cases, right? 500 cases here, 10 cases there, 50 cases there. But unless you know how many people are essentially the denominator, you don't know much about it. Maybe those 500 cases came from Nairobi, which is a city of what? 8 million? 3 million? Sorry. Uh, and maybe those 10 cases were every single person in a given village. So 500 sounds like a lot, and 10 sounds like a little, and they may be quite the reverse. So we need to know about people, right? That's the sampling universe for, for cases of malaria. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but that is the, uh, <coughs> the malaria positive rate. You can see the bad areas are out in western and northern Kenya. But then, They've taken, let's see, this is human movements. What, literally what they're doing is they're tracking cell phones and seeing where they move. And so they're, they're seeing how human movements translate into moving these parasites around, or the potential for moving these parasites around. And that gives them a much better view of where are the sources versus where are just the dispersal areas for malaria across Kenya. Really interesting study. My point in all of this is you might use this as your uh, sampling bias characterization because it's essentially showing where <coughs> malaria has the potential to arrive. Okay? You could also, in this case, use a human population density surface. If you work with small mammals, if you work with one species of small mammal, you could work with all species of small mammals and count the frequency across your region. Or if you're interested in one species of Aedes mosquito, you could think, okay, what's the population of records that are collected similar? Maybe it's all Aedes mosquitoes instead of just Aedes aegypti. So you can make a sampling surface. It takes work. We will not get it done this week. But you can make a sampling surface and use that as some degree of correction for those crazy biases to show. Because that way you take into account that you have 3 million people in Nairobi and only 10 people in that other one. Okay, so solutions to deal with, let's just say, crazy biases, when concentrations of sampling and effort are extreme, like that smallmouth bass example, you can just verify. You can just artificially reduce the density of records from those oversampling areas. When you have spatial autocorrelation and clumped points, you can verify the data, like I did in the asterisk example, you can verify the data to take into account what's called the spatial lag, that, that area over which points are not independent. 
Uh, probably best is you can include a spatial bias layer in model development. We'll show you where that goes in that set, okay? And then in the future, there are these, these hybrid models that are far more complex than what we're doing, but which incorporate spatial autocorrelation terms directly. So remember that, okay, garbage in, garbage out. If you want a biological meaningful niche model, a biological meaningful result, then do everything you can to make sure you're not feeding garbage into any of, my, any of these, these algorithms, okay? Uh, it's very easy, but I'll give you one statistic. It's more or less imagined, but I'll bet that for all the studies that I've been involved in, I bet I spend 75 to 80 percent of my time preparing, cleaning, thinking about, and pondering data, and 20 to 25 percent of my time actually fitting them up. That a reasonable proportion? So, yeah, we're in, we're in day two, and you haven't run an niche model yet. Okay. It's actually, you'll, you'll be running niche models within a couple hours. Um, if you want to avoid the garbage in, garbage out situation, you need to think about these questions of um, data quality before you try to think about which algorithm and running them off.